first question. Good evening. Uh, uh, thanks for having these uh, forum and meetings again. Uh, my name is Mike Carberry. I'm with the uh, Sierra Club, uh, the Sierra Club's uh, Nuclear Free Campaign, which is a national campaign uh, that is uh, trying to move us beyond nuclear power. So obviously you, you, you know my perspective. I noticed that you closed out um, the yellow fighting on flooding, and it was done last week, which was all strangely coincidental or ironic that we had massive flooding in Colorado. And uh, you were talking about, uh, you know, beyond design basis that you are uh, protecting us from flood, but that would be massively beyond. Now, we've been told that there are six uh, dams on the Missouri River uh, above Omaha. And now with climate change, we are seeing this sort of uh, weather disruption, bad weather, massive flooding, drought, all sorts of things like this. And uh, how are we uh, supposed to feel comfortable that if something like what happened in Colorado within the last couple weeks happened on the upper uh, Missouri River uh, Basin, if that happened, that we wouldn't uh, have cascading dam failure and uh, have Fort Calhoun Station be under 50 foot of water. Have you looked at 50 feet of water? That's my question. Well, I think the first thing I wanted to ask is uh, the person here up front that's setting up this camera. Is it possible that you can stay in your seats? Well, he asked me to move. They have a cameraman. He asked me to move my camera because it was in the shot to get you. So I'm actually responding to the crew. Okay. Okay. I didn't, I didn't just jump up for no reason. So, you know, I'm, I'm not insane. I'm okay. The camera people are working together because we're like that. Yeah, yeah I, I think that I want to um, actually say something to begin with. Um, and, you know, the, the exact things that you talk about are the things that we discuss with the Army Corps of Engineers, which is um, the entity that manages the dams, you know, on the river. And, you know, this is something that, um, you know, we also have a very um, strong interest in is um, making sure that the, um, you know, the integrity of the dams, um, looking at of the possible scenarios and um, understanding what the scenarios are that the plan needs to protect against, what should be in their licensing basis, and also, you know, the, these particular uh, scenarios work, which go beyond the um, design and licensing basis. So these are all things that we look at. These are all things that we consider. In fact, you know, we also have a group um, back at headquarters that is looking at this, not just for Fort Calhoun, but for all the plants, because all the plants have their unique situation, their unique design. And, you know, I understand what you're saying about, you know, Colorado. And, you know, it's not just the every day you've got to think about it. It's also the scenarios that go beyond. Um, so that we have a group that is um, looking at um, this situation for all the plants, and also um, there's a reanalysis being done within the context of um, what they're what they've been asked to look at. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of work underway, but in the interim, what we're trying to do is make sure that the, the licensing basis and what we're protecting against is robust enough for today as well. So, you know, there's actually two things that are going on. One is the current day, and another is looking at a reanalysis that um, is going to be submitted next year and um, the reviews and if they indicate even more that needs to be done then that's what we would um, also expect as well. Thank you. I'd like to read one of the comment cards. What has the NRC done to verify that the new Exelon managers understand the unique four chemical licensing basis, design basis, and technical specifications? Uh, if, if you look on the NRC document for Calhoun, we, we did do a review of the management agreements between Fort Calhoun and or OPBD and Exelon. And, and we issued a letter stating that within the regulations of CFR 5080 for ownership and control, we do not have a problem with the arrangement that they have. And OPBD remains the licensed entity that is responsible for safe operation and knowledge of the design of licensing basis. Thank you. 
In this mark, I'd just like to build a, a little bit on that. You know, as, as Mr. Swanson talked about the shift manager and the senior licensed individuals on shift, as well as uh, one of Mr. Swanson's direct reports is the senior license for the site. So that license knowledge is, uh, is well embedded in the operations department, as well as the leadership development that we have focused on. And so while we provide you know, an opportunity to, to have our operations department you know, use the technical expertise of the fleet, uh, by no means does that uh, you know, advocate for, for or in any way dilute what the licensed operators are, are licensed to do for the station is to make those technical decisions um, you know, for the plant as well as the, you know, the technical conscience for the station. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brian Keene. I live in Missouri Valley, Iowa, which is in the evacuation zone. Um, my question is about the karst formations and cascading failures and the, uh, the idea in risk management that you have to multiply various risks that, you, that you're that you entertaining in a given operation. So what you have in Fort Calhoun is uh, a known geographic, uh, geological defect known as karst formations that was kind of um, glossed over when it was originally built, not informed to the public, but now we understand that this is it's a formation that can cause sinkholes. So you add the possibility of sinkholes on top of the construction defects that weren't up to spec, and then you add into that potential for floods, exacerbating the karst formations that nobody knows what what situation they're at today since flooding. They were only examined when the, when the plant was built 50 some years ago, whatever that was. So you're, you're really just assuming, you know, they're making big assumptions that the plant operation is safe based on various analysis that's done by people that have vested interest of that plant built operation. I would suggest that we need to take a broader look at all of the potential failures, flood, uh, dam failures, earthquakes, known defects of the geological um, uh, underlying the foundation of that plan, and say, does it really make sense for it to go into operation? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. I'm uh, John Paul. Uh, I would like to uh, add on to the uh, comments of the first gentleman uh, with reference to uh, action number 4.4.3.2, review flood design bases and determine if the 2011 flood event provides additional information that should drive design basis changes. To me as a meteorologist with uh, 30 years of forecasting experience, what I learned from this event was number one, it wouldn't have taken something greatly larger in magnitude to cause a dam failure than what we already had in 2011, because they had to let that water run down the system, whether it was weakening the dam structure or not. They couldn't hold very much back in that situation. Uh, this puts the possibility of a dam failure in something of the same order of probability as a direct hit from a tornado, which is something that you're already preparing for. It's not a likely hazard, but it's sufficiently possible that you can see a need to prepare for it. And I think that this is of roughly the same order of magnitude. Uh, we already did have a larger flood in 1881. And those of you who flew in here might have noticed that you crossed through a little piece of Iowa getting from the airport to downtown. The reason you did that is because before the 1881 flood, the Missouri River ran through there and it looped back. And that flood was big enough to cut off that loop so that what is now dry land was run over was the main channel of the Missouri River. That was a bigger one than we had last year. That was a bigger one than we had in 1952, which was why the dam system was put in. Uh, I thank you for your time, and I trust that you will be what you say, independent and thorough, and look at this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
Uh, Mike Ryan, uh, I'm here tonight as a spokesperson for Clean Nebraska. Uh, a little bit of news, uh, a couple of things have happened uh, since the last uh, public meeting we've had here in Omaha. Uh, a couple of things, you know, they don't always make the media here, but they're playing big events in the, uh, the nuclear world. Uh, Vermont Yankee nuclear plant, of course in the state of Vermont, it is closing for economic reasons. Um, it's a merchant plant. Electricity <coughs> generated there is sold for a profit. What these merchant generators are finding throughout the country is nuclear is not the cheapest way to go anymore. It's too expensive. They have to shut down their plants when they're not making a profit. OPPD doesn't have to. They just raise the rates, which they've done 10 times in the last 10 years. Uh, another piece of news, last, uh, last meeting, uh, I and probably some other people mentioned about a uh, recent article in Bloomberg where Moody's was concerned about tornado preparedness at Fort Calhoun. Man, the quickest movement I've seen from a government agency happened right before our eyes within a week after OPPD requested a license amendment to lower the threshold uh, that one had to worry about for winds in a tornado. Uh, they got the license amendment, but sorry, that didn't do any good. Moody's has downgraded OPPD's bond rating, and it's going to cost all the ratepayers. I didn't see that in the news. About the same time, I did see uh, a lot of reports about the city of Omaha's bond rating uh, being lowered, but nothing about OPPD. So that's going to cost us in the future. It's going to cost more to service our bonds. Um, earlier, I believe uh, Mike Hay mentioned something about uh, uh, the high energy uh, lines that you, you're going to start taking a look at uh, uh, the high energy lines and, and uh, see if they were uh, environmentally qualified. Uh, now when you talk about high energy lines, I think you're talking about high pressure steam lines, right? Okay. Steam and water. Uh, it's my understanding from some recent information I got that uh, there is a problem with the high energy lines. As they move from room to room through holes in walls, uh, the holes are generally much bigger than the pipes going through them. So, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what the size of the pipes, all the pipes is, are, or what the size of the hole is, but picture a six inch uh, pipe going through a 12 inch hole in the wall. If that's the case, you've got a pretty big gap. Now, if, it, if this is a particular room where there's a, a, a break in the steam line, you'd like to localize that break. You'd like it to stay within that room. If you've got these gaps uh, in these walls uh, where there's these uh, uh, penetrations of these lines, uh, that steam's going to escape. And what happens is it can get into electrical panels and cause shorts. And you don't want electrical shorts in a nuclear plant because you start losing things like cooling and your reactor starts to heat up, your spent fuel pool starts to heat up, you have big explosions like we have at Fukushima. So I understand from what you said you're going to start taking a look at that and, and I hope you see that as a problem and that you uh, deal with, uh, uh, with these gaps as they go through the walls. I, just just to respond to that, yeah. I mean, it's not that we're going to start looking at it. We've been extensively looking at it. And I guess to clarify something, it's it's known that there are gaps between rooms. I mean, that's by design. And, and if you read the licensee's event report a few weeks back that dealt with the health concern, it was recognized that a line break in a, in a room could affect another room, specifically the first room. <coughs> So, I mean, what, what you're saying is true, but it's known, 
and that's what's being evaluated and resolved. And what I've heard is it's been known for quite a few years and, and hasn't been dealt with. Um, I want to I want to talk just just a, a little bit about uh, uh, the dam failure of flood issue. Mr. Ryan, can we get to some other folks and come back to you? You know, it's it's interesting that these uh, meetings are for the public. And uh, before we get a chance to talk, uh, you put all kinds of stipulations on our testimony. But these folks, you know, you never say anything to them. There's no stipulations or, or parameters that they have to follow. Well, well, frankly, actually, there are parameters. Uh, there's an understanding of how long we're going to talk. There's an understanding of how long they're going to talk so that we can provide the public with an opportunity to speak also. And so, you know, the only, the only parameters we're putting on this part right now is how long each person gets to talk so that we share the opportunity amongst all of the public. We'll I just, be sure to get back to you, Mr. Warren. Yeah, I, you know, I'm willing to, to sit down and get back up, but, uh, but just the, uh, the tone of the meeting, uh, the public, I think, feels very left out. You know, we sit here meeting after meeting and basically hear the same stuff from you guys. And, uh, Generally, by then, if there's any news media, uh, they're gone, and the public never gets a chance to uh, inform the rest of the public what's going on, because uh, I don't think they're going to get a true picture. First of all, you can't understand a lot of what's said because you're using news speak or you're using Harvard speak. So to the general public, it's very hard to understand. And uh, you know, I think a lot of us try and, and simplify it and make it palatable for the public, but the press, the press is gone. Thank you. I'd like to read another note card. Slides 21 and 27 indicate five phases and only one phase is completed. So with all the delays taking place, is our civil service going to fire a dozen of you headers from NRC or OPPD? I think this is a question for you. Yeah, Bruce, you want to touch on slide 21, which was uh, dealing with the key calculation review. And then uh, on slide 27, I'll touch on what we're at again with uh, integration. And I'm sorry, I was going to have you repeat the question. Slides 21 and 27 indicate five phases, and only phase one is completed. So with all of the delays taking place, is our civil service going to fire a dozen of you headers from NRC or OPPD? Bruce Thrash from uh, OPPD for the recovery. I'll answer the key count question. There are three phases to that project. Phases one and two, one is complete, that's the scoping. Two is the review. Phase three is a more detailed review. This is a process that was adopted from other plants that have been in the manual chapter 350 shutdown. We're using a known process that was accepted in the industry as a best practice. It's implemented in many of the stations throughout the country that have implemented calc improvement processes. And it takes three to five years to get through that process. It'll be done in conjunction with the design and licensing basis. And that's the only way you can do it is to go one by one through the calculation. Yeah, and on slide 27, different topic, but it's our integration into the Exelon model. And there's actually the first two phases that are complete. The third phase, which is the design phase, is a little over 50% complete. Uh, but as, as the leader on site, they're very mindful as we do the integration. It does, it does involve work by the station personnel. So we've been as much focused on how do we provide additional oversight, and in some cases, how do we go pull forward activities that uh, we're going to do eventually, that we, that we will pull forward now that improve both the safety, uh, reliability, efficiency of the station. So as we, as we complete the next phases of, of working through heat up and ultimately start up, uh, in parallel with that, we will have completed the, the implementation phase of what do we need to focus on the remainder of 2013 and into 2014 to complete the transition. Uh, but again, as a leadership uh, and as the senior leader on site, just mindful of, of how much work that is by the site staff as we focus on, uh, on the improvement items that we discussed tonight. Thank you. I'm Wally Taylor with the uh, Sarah Club. And I had a question about the, uh, the 
even internal structures, the beams and columns that are insufficient. Um, you use the term operability as opposed to licensing basis or design basis, but it's my understanding they're going to need some significant repairs or replacements uh, because of those insufficient beams and columns. So, number one, what does operable mean? And number two, how can the plant be allowed to restart before those beams and columns are up to, uh, to be sufficient to carry out their their uh, function? When, when a licensee identifies a condition that's described as either non-conforming or degraded, that is in reference to how they're licensed. So, for example, you can find a non-conformance where the plant was licensed, let's say for containment structure, uh, under these design parameters, your, your structure is, is designed and, and, and built. And when you actually go and look to see how it was built, it wasn't quite built to those standards. That would be a non-conformance. Uh, but let's take, for example, they found a lot of the rebar in the, in the uh, structure was exposed to some kind of uh, water or chemical, and it had degraded. Uh, that would be a degraded condition. Uh, for either non-conforming or degraded conditions, the licensees are able to evaluate through a process that we call operability evaluations whether or not those system structures and components still meet the intent of the licensing basis. Um, so in, in this case, with the containment internal structure, even though we know the structure to some respects wasn't built as it was licensed, they can still do an operability evaluation that will demonstrate that, that there's still adequate safety margins for all of the design criteria that have to be met for, for the structure, such as dead weight loading, you know, different sizes of earthquakes, uh, different types of accidents. They, they basically couple all of these different scenarios together and ensure that the structure can still support uh, all of the equipment that's necessary. So, you know, this isn't uncommon. All licensees have the capability to evaluate degraded non-conforming conditions, but the, but the onus is on them to demonstrate that it's still capable of performing its design function. And obviously it's the NRC's job to review these evaluations and determine if we find them acceptable or not. Well, what were the problems with those structures and what will it take to fix them? Well, the licensee is in the process of evaluating exactly what it's going to take to fix them. Um, you know, I, I'll, I, I'd rather have them answer what they plan to do to fix them, but from my perspective, as I stated today, the NRC is going to be very interested in not only how they fix them, but the timeliness that they uh, fix them. Uh, and, you know, our guidance typically reflects the fact that we want licensees to correct degraded non-conforming conditions at the nearest opportunity <coughs> possible, typically not any later than the next refueling outage. So, you know, based on the complexity of this issue, we understand it's going to take the licensee some time to figure out exactly what the fix is, but we're expecting to see some significant, you know, changes and corrective actions next outage. Well, how can they be allowed to restart if they're basically in violation of the license on those well, they're, they're not. If they're operable, that doesn't mean they're not in violation. You know, we're, we're mixing things here. There is a violation. They're not meeting their license conditions. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the structure is not operable and that it still will satisfy its design basis function. There's, there's a lot of margin that the NRC requires the licenses to have. And obviously, when there's a degraded or non-conforming condition, some of that margin is lost. But that doesn't mean it's not safe. Thank you. Just uh, it's not the first time. It's weird that you would say that it's not safe, but you don't know what it takes to repair it because you're not done yet with the analysis. To me, that's just weird. But um, what I want to say, I want to contend some of the things that have been said tonight, and I hope you give me a chance. What has not been fixed at the plant? 
mean, in the sense of what have you not needed to fix? I mean, thousands of things have been fixed. And I'm just curious how much of the plan is left that is considered old, not new stuff that you put together. <laughs> Just a percentage. Yeah, Michael, let, let me start. Yeah, I'll, let, I'll let the team build on. So, so part of the system readiness that was described tonight and has been inspected is really a systematic review of, uh, of all of the components, uh, major components and support components. And, and, and what that does for us, it not only takes a look at equipment history, um, we also do extensive surveillance testing that proves that the equipment not only can run in its normal configuration, uh, but in support of uh, what it might do to support uh, you know, mitigating an accident. So that whole process is very systematically controlled and is verified by the operators that the plant is in a configuration, uh, both the way it's lined up valve-wise, breaker-wise, uh, but also testing-wise, that we meet the, uh, meet the design and licensing configuration of the plant. And you heard Mr. Swanson talk about a majority of the work that we've done across those systems. And as part of our license, if you know a plant component should break in the future, that will typically put restrictions on us for uh, for plant operations. But part of the recovery of the plant has been that systematic testing of, of each and all you know, each and all of the systems, uh, and using in, integrated teams between our maintenance engineering and operations personnel. Yeah, a good example. You know, uh, a few weeks ago, well, we've been running a lot of the pumps you know, recently, but you know, we ran our concept pump. We put an engineer out there. We put maintenance out there, we put ops out there, we put everyone out in the field, and we ran that pump. Very successful. Seal leaks, very minimal issues. So as we ask that question, if we got an issue with our, some of our equipment, we're going to fix it. You know, we test it, we run it, we're extensively testing. You know, as we're preparing for heat up, we are extensively testing all of our equipment as we speak. And if we find issues with it, we're going to fix it. The reason I'm concerned by that is whenever you put new equipment, because you mentioned that the equipment is going to run far superior than it did before, and the pressures are going to be a lot bigger, everything, because it's new. It's going to have its full pressurized deal. Any old piece of equipment that any of this new stuff is attached to is not going to be able to perform in the same as that new equipment. Just like when you repair cars, you know, you put a new old part or a new part on an old car and it blows out the next part because that old part could not handle the new, new pressures. And this is what concerns me, that, that you have a 40-year-old plant, you replace a whole bunch of stuff with new equipment, you're going to fire it up with new equipment pressures and new equipment heats and new equipment, and then that old equipment might not be able to respond, like expand and contract like the new equipment. It, the new equipment might be thinner because a lot of times we find metals are thinner even though they're stronger. And, the, and that thinness, that, 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 that response of the, of the heating and the cooling contraction will be different than the old equipment because that was thicker steel because it was made in 1950 and not in, you know, by, you know, right now. And that's where my concern is, is, is this new equipment attached to old equipment. It's kind of putting like lipstick on a pig kind of thing. And, and I'm really, really concerned that that, that old equipment is not going to be able to you know, hold up. And, and that's my big concern, and I'm hoping it's your concern also. And, and the question about the 20,000 hours. Now, you would have a budget, and your budget's 5,000 hours of plant, like you said. What happens to your budget when you have to spend 20,000 hours? I know what happened to ours. They spent $145 million last year to pay for it. So what happens to yours, the NRC's budget? I mean, how do you step up to that when you did not plan for a 20,000 hour power plant? Well, the, the biggest challenge that we've had is obviously finding the resources in the specialty in order to inspect what we've done in the past year. Uh, you know, I've mentioned over the number of public meetings that we've had here, uh, that's been one of the NRC's biggest challenges trying to be uh, responsive to when the licensee is done with certain activities for us to be able to review those activities. And, uh, you know, past meetings, I, I made a comment that it has frustrated us sometimes when the licensee thought they'd be ready and we had resources aligned to look at something uh, just to find out that they weren't ready. Um, you know, that, that hasn't been the case lately. Uh, to the extent that it was in the past, but but from from our perspective, that's that's been the biggest challenge is just getting the resources aligned with with 
inspections. Now, is there anything that would not be inspected because you don't have the resources? I mean, your budget just could run out and you just can't show up for that day or that thing or whatever. And I'm just wondering, when does your budget run out? And, 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 you know, and does that stop you from your oversight? And do they have to recoup any of these costs back to you? Like this OPPD for calling you in when they're not ready, do they have to re you know, pay you off or something? I mean, they got to you know, help you out? Or, or is that just not because you're a federal agency and you're taxed and that's it? They, they, get, they get charged for the hours that we, we spent there. The OPPD does? Yes, they, yes, they do. But let me give you another so perspective. Is that, is that in the future or in the, pa or, or in the past? I'll be in the future because we build them. They, You'll build they a license and then they, they, they <laughs> see the account all the time that we spend on this side. Let me give you a perspective on the budget. It's, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, we've mentioned it, this is an agency effort. All the regions are budget, excuse me? Yeah, all the regions are have a budget for the number of inspection hours per site. But in addition to that, each region is also budgeted to support other regional offices and headquarters for situations just like this, where we have a plan that has performance issues that are thoroughly evaluated and to make sure that the issues are addressed. So that is thought about ahead of time in, in the budget formation and have that, uh, the extra resources available. So it's not just from the Arlington office, the Region 4 office, for example. But we have both here from the Region 3 office in Lyle, Illinois, that James Cameron is here assisting us. That is part, part of the, the, the planning process that, that we looked at ahead of time. There is kind of need that there is resources available that we put the, uh, the emphasis on the, the safety of the care for these Thank you. Thank you. Remember Ryan, and I'm not sure if this microphone is working because I couldn't hear Mike Ryan when he was up. It, it's going in and out. Okay. If that's the best you have for the public, <laughs> really, I'll try to speak loud. <coughs> Let's talk a little bit about what happens when the heavy rains fall in Montana like they did in Colorado, and the wall of water knocks down the six aging dams above the aging Fort Calhoun plant. And the failure of Fort Calhoun is evident. What are the specifics of the evacuation plan for the people in the area? I assume there is one. What is it? After those sirens sound, what happens? How do people leave? Where do they go? What about people with no transportation, the infirm and so forth? Who directs the ine inevitable chaos? Is it the Fort Calhoun Police Department? Uh, what sort of public outreach have you done? to make sure that people are informed about the evacuation plan. Do you do any at all? Have you ever had a practice run involving members of the public, not just an emergency response team? Have you disseminated this evacuation plan to people beyond the standard 10 mile radius of the plan? If not, why not? I live in Omaha and I've never seen or heard anything about any kind of evacuation as it relates to Fort Calhoun, and certainly not to the failure of those six dams. And I'd like to point out that Omaha's northernmost city limit is at the 10 mile uh, point now, not 15 miles, which the media likes to uh, report. And I also want to point out that when Fukushima blew up, the United States insisted that all Americans within a 50, 5, 0, mile radius of the Fukushima plant evacuate. That's how important it was. And we have the 10 mile evacuation radius. I think that's misleading and it's unrealistic. It's an unrealistic circle of so-called safety when we're talking about a nuclear disaster. And I'd like to really know what is the evacuation plan? I don't think there is one. And we, I asked this, in fact, I went to the meeting in April of 2011 before the floods. And I asked the same question, and it was not answered. It was basically punted off as, you know, we're not Fukushima. We're not going to have a tsunami. And look what happened. And it's going to happen again. The unlikely, the unexpected is happening with more frequency. So what is the plan? 
Well, just to, just to answer some of what you talked about, with respect to the evacuation plan, you know, the, the county, the city, they're responsible for the evacuation plan. And, and FEMA ensures that, that that is all worked out appropriately. In, in addition to that, every couple of years, the NRC has what we call a graded emergency preparedness exercise, where we uh, basically have the licensee go through a severe accident scenario that would involve them identifying which members of the public need to be evacuated and ensuring that the state and local folks <coughs> understand how to implement those evacuation areas. And, and again, that's, that's an NRC and FEMA type evaluation. The NRC makes sure the licensee understands how to you know, do what's needed at the plant and to do what's needed to inform the state and locals on what needs to be evacuated. And then the state and locals take it from there and ensure that you're informed and, and know when to leave or when to shelter in, in place. So as far as the details, um, you know, I'm not prepared tonight to tell you all of the details, but, but that's, that's in general how all plants and, and how all localities near plants are structured so that the public does know what to do during any given accident. That's unacceptable. It sounds to me like I could go to Fort Calhoun and knock on the door of a resident nearby the plant and ask them, if something happens with this plant, do you know what to do? And I guarantee you they'll say, no. And I'll say, has anyone ever told you? Because I haven't seen anything publicized. I've not seen things on the news media, on TV, nothing. And this should be, the, that's why I asked, what has been the community outreach? Now you pushed it off on the county, but the NRC, you said you had this every two years. But you do it with the emergency response team. But you don't involve the public. And we're the ones at risk. We're the ones at risk now more than ever. And you talk about restart, reheating. I don't care about that. I don't want that started up until you can guarantee me you've got a plan. Then you don't have one that involves the public. Okay, thank you. Part of our public outreach does, does include a direct mailing to each of the citizens in the 10 mile emergency planning zone, plus other public outreach activities. And as, as Mr. Hay mentioned, that includes not only the counties and the local municipalities, but also the state and our graded exercise, which we're looking forward to because we learn uh, good things from that as we work with FEMA and the state. Our, our graded exercise will be in December of this year. I believe that also includes a public meeting in Blair with FEMA to discuss the results of what we learned from that, uh, from that exercise. Mrs. Ryan, I'd also like to add something. You made the connotation that the, the flooding, the, the agency, the NRC doesn't care. Uh, I'd just like to remind you a little bit that it was the NRC that identified the issues with the flooding, the mitigating strategies that were inadequate prior to the floods in 2011. As it, I think it was a contributor to and the actions that Fort Calhoun took that when the flooding did occur, there was no, there was not a negative impact on public health and safety as a result. The plan remained in a safe condition. And the other piece of that is, yes, we are concerned from to learn from Fukushima, to learn from the natural, natural disasters that have occurred, as Louise has talked about, that, and, and we're going through working with other agencies as well to ensure that the public safety as well and and really the, the key for, for what we're looking at here is that for Calhoun station if there was a, a flood it is that the plant will remain safe and that the reactor will remain safe that there won't there, there will not be a negative impact on the public from the nuclear reactor I, I, Ms. Bryan, again, I would like to, I think Lou makes a good point there that really the NRC did wonderful work in, in identifying those risks both relative to the flood, and, and I really have to agree with it. If it were not for NRC really um, uh, being as proactive as you were and in insisting on those changes, uh, public would have been adversely affected 
much bordering, but that being said, there, there were very good points made. Uh, uh, even though you mail something out, people get, they consider that junk mail, I believe. Mean, and it's good, it's a, it's a beautiful pamphlet, but nobody reads it. And so if you were to call, just randomly call people in Blair, Missouri Valley, Fort Campbell, and say, what's your escape route? They would have no clue. I'm guaranteeing you that right now. If there was ever, if the sirens went off, we would assume it's a tornado or that it's an ambulance or a fire call and that the volunteer fire department has to come. There's no way for us to know that the siren means it's a nuclear accident or it's a, it's a fire emergency or it's a... So there needs to be some way to distinguish a nuclear situation versus another emergency. So I think that's a deficiency in, in the way that the public is notified. But beyond that, um, there are significant deficiencies. I know everybody has the, the best intentions relative to evacuation preparations, but I have to say that a lot of this exercise and you know, I, I talked to the mayor of our town and said, when was the last time that the town actually did a practice evacuation for the schools, for the hospital, for the old folks home? It's never been done. They have, even though uh, maybe there's a plan in somebody's book at the county seat, and maybe there's a few people that understood what that would, could they make it to the town to implement it? And I, I really doubt that that would be the case. But there, there has been some advancements but there's not enough really to say that we're truly prepared. And I think that's why when you factor in, there's, there's these known deficiencies, but we think it's okay because even though the cement degrades over years, and it's been 40 years, it's been irradiated, and there's been water penetrations, and, and the cement's probably okay, and we think that based on these calculations, we think that the generator that failed at San Onofre, we know it failed, well, we have these calculations to say it's probably safe. When you multiply all those things together, that's when it starts to fall apart to say maybe it really is not safe. Maybe we want to make power, but maybe we want safety too. Maybe that is more important at the end of the day. Thank you. And my name is Crystal Craig, and um, I'm a member of the Nebraska Sierra Club, as well as some organizations but mostly I'm a mother and um, mostly I, I suppose I would like to make a statement rather than ask a question because as was stated earlier I, mean, I don't understand a lot of stuff a different language trying to understand exactly what you guys are talking about um, but I would like to just announce that I am also a paying open pay customer and I am not comfortable with risking the safety of my children for this energy. And it seems to me like there were, you guys had plenty of time in the past to make some modifications that were recommended, you know, as far as raising the flood gates and, um, and things like that, and they were not implemented. And had they been, you know, then you maybe would have been in, even, in an even better position. Um, and it, it seems to me like we are playing a very risky game here and the people that are living in the vicinity are the ones who are taking the risk for this form of energy and I'm not I've been to a couple of these meetings and I just am not comforted at all and I, I'm just like you know a person walking in here that doesn't I'm not an expert or anything and it's just doesn't comfort me one little bit, like the number of issues that there are, um, that's like, a, it's a lot, you know, a lot, a lot of problems, and we've spent a lot, a lot, a lot of money on this, and our rates are going up, it's, it's not our cheapest energy form, because we are spending so much money on this, um, I, 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 uh, I would like to know what your estimate is as far as additional spending, um, how much more spending in man hours is it going to take to fix this plant? Um, you know, should we have maybe just started over from, from scratch at this point? Um, I guess that is a question. Can you tell me how much more um, rate payers are expected 
to pay into this non-functional plant that's been non-functioning for the past two years and we're still paying a lot, a lot, a lot of money um, when there are other alternative energy resources. Why are we feeding this dead horse? If you don't mind, let me just kind of interject. One of the things Brown that we talked about that we're not going to get about the financial issues, but the community is about forecast and safety. And you mentioned something and said, you know, this is a risky game. Uh, this is not a game. And we do take the safety it's very, very serious. In fact, the residents, we have inspectors that work pretty on our seat that do live in the vicinity of the Fort Collins Station. They, they're also there. And they, so they, they're sure you're concerned. They want the plant to be as safe as, as possible. But as possible, I mean, you say as safe as possible. Can we have like a 100% safety guarantee here? I mean, like, that's really what is important, is safety. So what does it matter if it's, you know, we have electricity or not, if we're all suffering from our choice of energy here? Like, if this plant was so far outdated and so far gone, I mean, where where do we draw the line and say this is just not worth repairing here? Like, it's, there are too many safety issues. Issues continually are popping up. You know, what happens if they get the go-ahead and then all this, there are more issues that have been undiscovered. I mean, how much is too much? What I can tell you is that we will do whatever we can, the whole agency effort, to ensure that the plan is safe. <coughs> and we'll, that the safety systems will work, that the, we talked about the, the processes that are in place, and that the people are ready to operate the plant. We haven't made a decision yet on that, but that's what we'll be doing to ensure safety. Thank you. Another note card. I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase this one. Are the standard, the regulatory standards imposed by the NRC available to all nuclear plants so that we have no surprises? And I think this is going towards, uh, aggressive towards restart. Can you repeat that again on the regulatory standards? Avail that are imposed by the NRC, available to all nuclear plants, so that there are no surprises. Well, I, yes, uh, all of the requirements on how to operate the plant are contained in the Code of Federal Regulations. In addition to that, every plant has what's called a license, which dictates what license conditions are imposed in addition to the, what's in the Code of Federal Regulations. So there shouldn't be any unknown uh, standards or requirements that, that licensees shouldn't be aware of. Thank you. With respect to the flooding protection, uh, you've closed out that issue, as I understand it. And I'd like to know where the public can get documentation or information on exactly what modifications OPPD made to Fort Calhoun uh, to uh, justify your closing out that issue, especially with respect to the, uh, the question of the upstream dam failures. Uh, all I've seen was, I think back in May, OPPD had a, a little drawing of the floodgate and that kind of thing. But I'd, I'd like to see some real documentation of exactly what modifications they made and why your panel was satisfied that OPPD is safe, or that Fort Calhoun is safe from flooding, including the upstream dam failures. Is that available to the public? Absolutely. Matter of fact, uh, there's a lot of reports that have been issued since last <coughs> December that pertain to flooding. Uh, matter of fact, there was one standalone report that specifically addressed the modifications that the licensee made to the intake structure, uh, where we uh, basically determined that they didn't adequately implement the modification process and, and didn't implement what's called the 50-59 process, right, which is a process by which we determine is NRC review and approval needed when they make those mods. Uh, so, 
That's one report that is specifically devoted to flooding. In addition to that, there are also other reports that specifically talk to the different areas of flooding that we looked at. The sluice gates, we had multiple issues where we talked about uh, sluice gates leaking, sluice gates not being tested right. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned previously we looked at other uh, flooding aspects also. So I, I, I would tell you it's, it's, it's there if you go and look what's on the docket. Now with respect to the With respect to the dam failure, uh, that has not been on the docket yet. We are still in the process of working with the Corps of Engineers. We are still internally, we have a group of people that are specifically devoted to looking at the, the different uh, uh, flood studies that are currently uh, available. And, and there are more studies that are going to be done. So, as of right now, there is no specific report that deals with dam failures. However, as I mentioned, we are going to be inspecting a strategy that the licensee developed, which will take into account higher flood elevations than, than their licensee basis. And, and that, that inspection will be done during HEDA, and that will be documented. I, I, think, I think, Wally, um, Part of what your your question is getting to is if you look at the restart checklist basis document and you look at the structure of most of the reports that I've done and you take the individual items in there and say this is closed because this is what we did and I think that's kind of what you're getting at wow. with, se with section one on the flooding so we were a little proactive uh, today to tell you uh, that the panel uh, had close that item so we're a little bit ahead of the report so where all of that information all together in one place you'll be able to get to will be the sooner of my next inspection report which period ends September 30th or the most recent a big team report. It will be documented in one of those two. That's where you'll be able to get all of the information that Mike talked about accumulated together and why we decided, why the panel decided to close that issue. I think that's what you Yeah, the problem is that I'm just a lawyer, so I'm... Right. No, no, I, <laughs> I understand, but I, I, I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Mike Carberry again with the Sierra Club. Uh, you had uh, said uh, actions in progress. You listed geotechnical. Well, one of the issues that's geotechnical that I'm very concerned about is subsoil structures and underground cables. As we all know, we had a major flood there in uh, 2011, and the uh, water weighs eight pounds a gallon. And so there were how many millions of gallons of water that weigh eight? get eight pounds per gallon that were sitting on top for a long time. Some underground cable, and subsoil structures, and Fort Calhoun. Uh, a colleague of mine named Paul Gunter from Beyond Nuclear uh, was very interested in this and submitted a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act to the NRC over a year and a half ago to find out a little bit about that. He's been basically stonewalled for a year and a half. So my question to the NRC here is how much of the uh, unqualified cable, I mean, there's a lot of things that got wet that shouldn't have been wet. There's a lot of things that probably got crushed that shouldn't have been crushed. How much of this underground cable and subsoil structures have been looked at? And what can you tell us about that? That's probably, other than flooding, is my biggest concern about uh, a restart of the cable. If you look at the reports that dealt with the flood recovery, which I spoke of earlier today, you will see uh, in there um, flood recovery actions that have to do with underground cable that runs from the switchyard to the plant that was replaced. And 
I, I can get with you and at some point get you specific inspection report numbers at a later date if you want to. Beyond that, all of the safety related cables that are underground are between the auxiliary building and the intake structure. And we've heard a lot of discussion over time, and I know OPPD mentioned it earlier today, uh, manhole 5 and manhole 31. Uh, and that's the cables traversed from the auxiliary building into the intake structure through those two manholes. Uh, manhole 31, it had substantial damage and a lot of work was done to the manhole itself. All of the cables that traversed through there were in conduit. So they did get the conduit repaired, and again, I get you the inspection report numbers on, on the actual cable testing that they did find out that the cable itself had some protection uh, from the water, from the conduit, but all of the cable, the safety-related cable between those two buildings uh, tested satisfactorily. I look forward to getting those from you, John. Thank you. You, you. you bet. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Alan Wolfen. I'm one of the tens of millions of people who drink water from the Missouri River downstream from the Fort Hill plant. Uh, and I'm concerned, I understand that it's going to be very, should we say, awkward, uh, difficult to move the plant away from the river. But there is spent fuel stored on site on what I'm going to refer to as the flood plain. I don't know if that's the legal flood plain, but it is the plain where the floodwaters go when it floods. Uh, there was a number like 50 feet tossed out earlier. You wouldn't have to move that very far, like a mile or less, to get it 50 feet higher than it is now. Um, does the NRC <laughs> I know there are reevaluations of ways to try to test storage, and there's a, a March 12, 2015 day to have flooding hazards reevaluated. But do we really need to wait to get that spent fuel out of the flood? That we did, that's, a, that's a very good question. But one of the things that we focused on and we looked at is the impact of flooding on the independent spent fuel storage installation where the fuel is being stored. And actually, the way it's been configured is that currently, right now, there's air that goes through the cool tank. And the evaluation was done to see that, okay, if it was all covered with water, what would happen? Because it's all within a stainless steel caps. It's not like the fuel is just out there, right? So it would still remain cool and it would still be protected within that cap. Regarding the moving it, you know, 50 feet higher or whatever, I don't know of any study or anything that done that. But I know that the, that the casts have been evaluated for being in, in a bloody condition. Thank you. One small point about uh, the evacuation uh, uh, problem. Um, the actual distance from uh, Omaha to Fort Calhoun is 10 miles. If you go to Google Earth and, and uh, use their distance measuring tool, you'll see that Fort Calhoun is only 10 miles from the northern uh, city limits up by uh, standing there. Late. It's just bugged me for a long time, but every article I read every TV, TV report about it. Uh, Fort Calhoun talks about it being 20 miles away. It's not. Um, another thing about uh, evacuation, and uh, my wife said that uh, uh, there appears to not be any kind of a plan, uh, especially for Omaha, or if there is one, we don't know about it. So what do we do? Now, I've seen uh, in fairly recent uh, uh, television pieces, uh, members of the OPPD staff, 
and the excellent folks wearing these black uh, health shirts with the nice little OPPD logo. I would suggest that you put on the back of the shirt something like, if you see me running, follow me. That's at least better than what we've got now. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the dam situation. And uh, I'm going to refer to three reports that were done by NRC staff. Uh, the first one was done by Dr. Ferrante. Uh, do you know if he's still, any of you folks uh, from the NRC, do you know if he's still a staff person at the NRC? This was done? I do not know. Okay. Big organization. This was done uh, uh, in 2010, and uh, he uh, did an analysis of uh, what would happen if there was one dam failure. Now, uh, back in 2011, I believe the highest level that the water got in Fort Calhoun was somewhere around 1,007 feet above sea level. Okay. What Dr. Ferrante is saying is uh, if there's a dam break, all normal plant equipment will fail at 10,010 ,010 feet above sea level, three feet more than what we had in 2011. Safety-related equipment fails at 10,014 feet, seven feet above the level we had in 2011. He predicts that that one dam failure uh, would give us a water level at Fort Calhoun of 1,029 feet. That's 22 feet above the level that was experienced in 2011. Uh, the flood wave would hit in 2.6 days from one large dam fill. Peak flood at the 10,029 feet would hit in 3.9 days. Now we'd have some advanced notice, but we can't pick the plant up and move it. We can't pick up all the spent fuel and move it. The second report and this, uh, this report uh, doesn't necessarily uh, uh, give a figure in feet as to what would happen over the dam failure, but it's the, the Perkins report. And there was a lot of uh, hullabaloo about uh, getting this information out. Uh, I think, Mike, uh, you had some experience with, uh, uh, with that particular report, but it, was fi it finally came out and uh, uh, you know, copies are available. But this report was done by an engineer uh, at the NRC, an, an NRC employee, another engineer, and two PhDs. Uh, the engineer's name was Perkins, and he got whistleblower protection. Uh, in that uh, analysis, uh, various uh, uh, reactors were rated uh, as far as uh, probable effects from flooding, from dam failure, and Fort Calhoun was right up there at the top of the list with Okani and some others. Uh, in that previous report, uh, again, Fort Calhoun was at the top of the list. It was rated high uh, probability. Uh, Cooper Station down south of us was rated at medium probability. The last report, the most recent report, is the Loveless report. Now, we haven't been able to get our hands on that report. But we got, got kind of a brief synopsis in a memo that was sent to Elmo Collins, uh, the formal, former uh, head guy of Region 4. And in that memo, it described uh, some things that were in this Loveless analysis. And supposedly, again, an NRC employee, Loveless, uh, he used more recent core data and found that the break of the Oahe Dam, the failure of the Oahe Dam, would result in a flood level at Fort Calhoun of 1,060 feet above sea level. That's 53 feet above the level in 2011. Now realize these dams in South Dakota are made out of dirt. Their spillways are concrete, but if they're overtopped, they'll fail. As I mentioned at the last meeting, 
uh, Fort Peck Reservoir, uh, built in 1938 in Montana. That's the top dam. That's the first one. Failed in 1938. When there was a high wind event and waves were pushed over the top of the dam, the dam failed. It's just dirt, folks. That one isn't even compacted dirt. It's 75 years old. And it's just sitting there waiting for a heavy snow melt, maybe a big spring rain like they got in Colorado. Both of those events together are going to push it over. And so I'm sitting here with this gun pointed at my head, and my utility doesn't even need Fort Cal. They can meet the demand of the ratepayers without Fort Calhoun. Now I realize that you have to buy some power now because Fort Calhoun is shut down. But that's because you're selling power. Selling power outside of your ratepayer base. You're not a merchant utility, you're a public utility. And I'm tired of being victimized by my government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Tom Foster, former NRD director for the Papio Missouri River Valley Natural Resources District. And I just want to tell you that those dams are more 50% full of silt, so they are providing a false sense of security for our community and all the communities downstream. If you think they're going to hold back any uh, appreciable amount of flood water, you're wrong. So if you're not aware of these, you need to uh, blow them up on because when they say that poor Calhoun is at the top of the list uh, for uh, blood uh, potential, they're not kidding. And they might not even know that those dam reservoirs are full of dirt. They're not really holding back much water. They don't take hardly any water to fill them up. Thank you. I think we're right at one out of time now. Um, thank you. If you have any additional questions, remember the NRC staff will be around immediately following the meeting.